Um, so yeah, I'm Thomas. I'm a professional PureScript developer in Los Angeles. I work with Dave, Forrest, and Chris. Uh, we work at a company called CitizenNet, which is an ad tech machine learning company uh, owned by Condé Nast. And we're all full-time PureScript, and we're migrating from Angular to PureScript, first gradually and now a lot more rapidly. Uh, last year was my first year at LambdaConf. I was just working through Chris's book and figuring out how to write Haskell, and it's directly from the training that I did here and uh, the people that I met that I was recruited out of the FP chat Slack to become a developer. Um, so I'm very proud to return this year as a speaker. And I'd like to keep that cycle going. We're going to be hiring PureScript developers soon, so if you can handle the famously awful uh, weather of Los Angeles, then uh, I, I hope you will come speak to me after the talk and stay in touch uh, if you'd like to write PureScript. And with that in mind, uh, how many of you guys use PureScript or you would like to in a show of hand? That's good because this is all, all going to be pure script. So you might be in the wrong room. Otherwise, uh, if you didn't raise your hand, I hope you stay and, and learn a few things. Uh, a more useful question maybe is how many of you have any experience with halogen? Or you know what I mean when I say like the word halogen, what that is? OK, not that many of you. So this isn't an introduction to halogen talk. I will talk about halogen a little bit. Um, as I get in, I'll clarify some of the implementation of what you're looking at so it's not just total gibberish. But if you start to get last, lost, I hope that you resist the pull of email and um, stay with the key ideas. The ideas themselves that I'm talking about are pretty simple. Uh, so just stay with those and, and you'll be okay. And if you're asking questions about implementation, I'll answer a few, but I don't want to get too, too down that route because it can take up a lot of the talk. Uh, last question, how many of you guys have used components or like a component-based architecture React? OK, most of you. Good. So I won't spend too much time diving into like why we use components or, or what's good about them. I'll specifically be talking about their use in Halogen. And that brings me to the real reason for this talk, which is reusability. And as developers, we tend to think of this as a good thing. When things are reusable, our code is reusable, we don't have code duplication. When we don't have code duplication, we are less angry with our colleagues. We have less errors. We're a better parent. We have all sorts of reasons. Uh, why this reduces friction in our code bases and makes it a useful thing to strive for as much as we can. And when we're building user interfaces, components are a really nice way to encapsulate things like state and UI and behaviors and make them into these nice reusable packages that you can use all over your user interface. So this can be something as simple as a button. This is kind of the canonical example a lot of people start with. And you can take that button with some behavior and use it throughout the application. But What's nice is you can just as easily take something like an analytics tile with a graph that's hitting an API and has an entire tree of subcomponents, and you mount it the same way. You initialize it the same way and tile it through your UI. So components are one answer to reusability when we're writing uh, web applications, single page applications. Um, but they do have some problems, which is that when you have a shared base of behavior, and you need to share that behavior between two components, you start to run into issues. Because while components are really nice as these packages, as soon as you have something that you need to share between two of them, you start to run into a little bit of trouble. And that's most of what I want to talk about today, is how to get around that trouble and get through that last step, that last frontier, and make those components more reusable as well, uh, code between components. So my colleague Dave told me about working in a code base where they brought in a, a date picker. It might have been our code base. I hope not. Um, and bringing it in, and it works, and you have this date picker, and it's in the DOM, until all of a sudden you need some new behavior that the developer of the library doesn't have. It's not in the configuration record. It's not a CSS class you can hook into. And at that point, the dev isn't going to add something just to handle your unique use case. They have thousands and thousands of developers that they're trying to support as generically as possible. So you might fork the library, as they did, and add the behavior. And you didn't really get, you don't understand the internals that well, but it works, still, still good. And then you, two weeks later, you need another feature, and you bolt it on, and you're starting to diverge, and your fork gets out of sync. And then you have this, as he called it, a Frankenstein's monster uh, just kind of festering in your code base. And I argue that a lot of this comes from trying to make components more flexible without paying attention to the reusability. And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a moment. Before I do, uh, this is the first halogen component you will probably ever write if you go through the halogen guide. It's a button 
And all this button does is toggle on and off. Uh, and the toggling just changes what the text is. So we see some of like, the key parts of, of halogen here. We have the state, which is private, and it's just going to be a Boolean. We have our behavior, which is represented with this query and the eval function. And this is, when I talk about behavior, I'm mostly talking about the query and eval function that handles it. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more about those later. But when we look at this component, we can see that basically all that it does is this toggling. And then it also has this private rendering function. So what this does is takes that Boolean in state and renders out some text to the page in a button. When you click on that button, there's our toggle query. I can't really mouse over it, but if you stay with me here, there's the toggle uh, query, which when it's raised, the eval runs. And that's a very quick crash course in how a halogen component looks like. Now we have a colleague who comes to you and says, oh, I am developing a really similar component, and I want to use your component because you've already implemented this for me. Ideally, this isn't just toggling, it's something more complex, but they don't want to re-implement the behavior, they want to use yours. Except the component looks totally different. It's actually not even, it's not a button at all. It's actually a confirmation dialog with like a video embedded. It needs to do all this other stuff, but it has that shared toggling behavior, and that's what you really want to hold on to. How would we share this component with them? How do we let them reuse some of our implementation? In our code base, uh, we've, ex we've experienced all of the strategies that I'm about to talk about, and we, we see them pretty often uh, as we're active in the open source PureScript community. Uh, the first strategy I like to call the go write your own component, get out of here. Basically a long version of screw off, I don't want to help. Sometimes this is actually the right move. Sometimes the things that you're trying to share are too divergent or, or too simple to incur like a module dependency. If it's something as simple as I want to share the act of clicking a button and updating one field in state, really you shouldn't be sharing that. It's, it's too small. So sometimes this is the right move, but it's definitely not reusability. Like we're definitely not there yet. The next one is pretty common, which is I have this toggling behavior, and I've got this render function for it, and my component is encapsulated, it's opaque. You see the inputs and you see the outputs. But what I need is some way to modify what the internals are. And so what you end up doing is maybe writing a configuration record. You say, well, if A, then use my toggling button. And if B, I'm going to use this uh, other set of information that our colleague is asked to add into the component. And this is pretty common in open source components. You, you go in and you pull in that date picker and you find the configuration record, all the stuff that you can update about it. And then as soon as you need to do something that's not in that record, you get to a bit of an impasse. And I don't want to talk, talk too much, uh, talk negatively about configuration because it's usually necessary. You just want as little of it as possible. The other thing that uh, fits into to configuration is what we were talking about a little bit at the beginning with CSS. And often a component will give you this tree of HTML with some CSS classes that you can style yourself. So you provide the implementation for that. And that's really, like, while it's not a record, um, that's still another form of configuration. And at this point, this makes components more flexible. It makes it so that a component can be modified in more ways. But it's still not quite reusability, because any time that you need to add a new bit of behavior, something new, or the rendering is very different, they have to come to you and ask you to do it, and then you to support it for them. So while this is more flexibility, it's importantly not yet more reusability. Which takes me to our first our first stab at actual reusability in components. And this is a really common pattern in React, higher order components. Uh, and what this refers to is you have a component that takes a component as an argument and returns a new component as its output. And that new component has been augmented with new state and behaviors and that kind of thing. Unfortunately, in Halogen, this is a little bit uh, trickier than it is in, say, React. Uh, we have to have our types unify across the board. Halogen is very type safe. And so what you end up doing is wrapping the component and using proxies and coyonata and like lifting queries through layers and that sort of thing, which, is, which works, but is a little bit tedious. And when you're in the position where you need a fully transparent intermediate component, where you want to say you want to mount a type ahead, augment it with this new stuff, but still be able to send queries to your original type ahead just as if there was no intermediate, this is really the, the way to do it in Halogen. Now, other people, we don't use this pattern very much ourselves, and I'll get to why in a moment. Uh, 
Um, Halogen has a pretty nice section in their examples that walks through doing this. Uh, I don't use this pattern enough to be familiar to answer maybe all the questions that you might have about it, but I can certainly try and answer a few. The reason that we don't use this pattern is because we use a newer pattern um, that is not fully transparent, but is very, very, makes it very easy to reuse components, specifically when most of your reuse comes from a set of behavior that you're just adding on top of. You don't need to see what the old behaviors were. You need a new, smaller interface, and you want all of your UI code to be completely under your control. And this is what drove us to the approach originally, was trying to take a component that had all the same behavior, but just all the HTML was totally different. And trying to reuse that was very difficult. It was the inspiration for uh, what we call renderless components. And renderless components refers to taking that render function, which goes from state to HTML, and is actually putting that design out into the DOM, uh, taking that entirely out of the component, which is a little bit false because you can't actually do this in Halogen. You can't have a component that doesn't render. It has to have a render function. In the rest of this talk, I'll explain how we are able to pull this off and how you can do it as well. Uh, it involves the store co-monad and all sorts of stuff, which is one of the few practical uses that we've had for co-monads so far. Um, but that's what makes this possible. And the main thing that you get from this is complete design control. You get to write whatever rendering function you want and then pass it into the component, which will just attach its behaviors. And when you do that, because you are the owner of this render function, you're the owner of the HTML, you have access to all of your own state. You can put anything you want into it before you pass it into the component. You don't have to do it via like querying into a layer. You don't have to do it by like responding to messages coming out of the component and, and trying to do this machinery, and you have no configuration record. You have a much smaller API. Instead, you write your state directly into the component, whatever you need, whatever data you need, and render based on it. And you can also embed any of your own behaviors into that render function when you pass it in. This is uh, the, uh, the core idea behind one open source component that we have called PureScript Halogen Select. Uh, this is the convention in PureScript is that all repositories start with PureScript, and then if it's a halogen component, it tends to have halogen next. So if you're ever bored and you want to find some halogen components, you can just search for PureScript halogen X in a GitHub. So these two components are both using the same underlying behavior, and the component that underlies both of these has no rendering at all. It has no render function. That's passed in. You can see that these also have some behaviors that maybe the other ones don't need to share. The calendar has all these dates that you're paging through, and the type ahead is loading and asynchronously fetching data. And all of this is possible with the same shared set of behaviors. So we get that code reuse for two very different components. So I know I've been going kind of quickly through some of these ideas. I wanted to pause and ask if anybody has a, a question they'd like to ask before I keep going. All right. Uh, it's more like the second, but what I'd say is that a higher order component is good when you need to preserve the ability to, as a parent, trigger behaviors in that component. So a component will have maybe 10 behaviors available to it, and you want to be able to say, okay, do this one, do this one, do this one. Most of the time you don't need to do this very often because most of those behaviors are being triggered by the component on itself, and it's encapsulated. So it's usually you're ignoring most of them and you only care about one or two. Um, if you have a case where you do really want to have access to all of them still, a higher order component will do that for you. If you use a renderless component, it's a lot simpler, and there's a lot less that you have to do as a consumer. And we'll, we'll get into that in a moment. There's actually very little. Except if you want access to all the same queries of the component that's the layer down, that original one, you'll have to like re-raise that query up. You'll have to basically re-export re the interface in a way, uh, which you don't need to do with the higher order components. So in most use cases, we take this approach because it's rare that we actually need to do that. Yeah. So um, several of you mentioned not being too familiar with halogen. So uh, I want to walk through what the key parts of it are when we're looking at a halogen component. I'm not so much talking about architecting an app or anything like that. Just when I show you these components and you're trying to look at it and see what the hell does this do, uh, this will hopefully give you an idea. I'm going to pause in between these slides 
for a moment to ask to let you guys ask any questions that you'd like, um, but I will cap it to maybe one or two just to avoid getting too much into the implementation. Oh, and yes, this is the repository. Uh, there's a fantastic halogen guide that they've written that walks through some beginner and some very advanced stuff. I'd recommend if you're new to halogen, uh, stay with me for the ideas. Don't worry about the implementation too much, but work through this guide. The PureScript channel in Slack is also fantastic for answering questions about this. It's where most of our questions get answered. And there's also a PureScript users forum uh, where there's lots of questions about halogen that are answered. So I'll talk more at the end about uh, further learning resources and that sort of thing if you want to keep going with this. So uh, as a, a brief refresher on what halogen is, it's a component architecture, it's a web framework uh, for writing single page applications in which components are the primary unit of reuse. So you'll write a lot of components and you'll use them just as we've been talking about so far all over your UI. These components are generally made up of some state, some behaviors that operate on that state and might also send messages to other components or consume messages from other components. Uh, input, which is those messages coming in. Output, which is how you notify other components about what's going on. And then finally, the rendering code, what actually gets shown to the user. Now, I find it the most, the most clear way I find to think about halogen and what's in these components when I show you this is it's very declarative. You have some data, and then separate from that, you have some function that handles it. So most of the time when you're writing stuff in Halogen, you're using the names of logic that you're going to run rather than just use a function directly. And I'll show you what I mean by that. This is the component that we're going to be working with. Uh, this is the broad view that we can come back to anytime you need to see the context of what the entire thing looks like. Uh, but nothing to say about this so far. Uh, this is the first bit. So we first talked about that private state that the component has. So here we have, it's typical to say that your state is a product type, or a record is most common, and it's got a bunch of fields, and this is the data that you care about, either for your behaviors or that you care about for your rendering. So here, is on is a Boolean. Uh, we might use this to say if the button should have a menu showing or not. And then text is the text that's actually going to be written uh, on the button. You can also see in here, already we're starting to get to behaviors because uh, toggle, so on click, what do we want to do? We want to toggle something. And that's referring to that toggling behavior that we already talked about. Uh, and you see that we didn't actually write any function in here. It's not a function to toggle stuff. It's a data constructor representing a computation we want to run. Uh, any questions about this one so far? Cool. The next one is uh, behaviors. And behaviors are managed with queries and evaluation. Um, those of you who have worked with free monads, this is a pretty similar pattern. Uh, so we have the names here, the queries are the names of computations we want to run, and eval is the actual computation. Now this ties back to state again, because eval is running within the state monad, and the state monad is over your state. So the first thing that this eval does is it gets the current state out, and then it changes it around, so we're just writing a monadic function here, and then it puts the state. And this is an important moment, because when a component puts state, when the, when the state is changed in any way, if it's ever modified, then the render function catches that and runs again. So every time the state changes, the render runs. Every time a query is triggered in, a, in your HTML, your eval runs. Every time your eval changes your state, your render runs, and so on. So you can see the cycle there. Any questions so far? Oh, yes. Uh, so raise is uh, a halogen function for sending a message. So it's for an output. And I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, that's a natural transformation. So the actual, um, the actual type signature would be query A. So you see our data constructor says query A. Uh, we're leaving the A off of both sides here. Next we have inputs. And now we're, we're finally getting to the, the public bit of the component. So state and behaviors are generally encapsulated. When you use one of these, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but when you're when you use it, you do have to worry about the input. And the input is like the argument to the component. The input uh, here is, is this string which we might use in this initial state function, which is from input to state uh, to set what the text is going to be. So every component has to, it's got this state type, but you actually have to have values at some point. So when you write your component, you have to give it some initial state. And the initial state doesn't have to use an input, 
but generally you will you'll might use parts of your input to set what that state is. The more interesting one is the receiver. And receiver is an input coming in from the outside world, and it triggers one of your queries. And typically, you'll name this query receive, and it represents a bundle of logic that every time I get new input as a stream, I want to perform this computation, which will usually update your state. So when you want a component to get changing inputs, you don't just want to give it one time as an argument. You want to continuously give it input. This is the only way to do it. You can't just give it as an argument. Finally, we have not a pairing of data and an evaluation. Uh, this is just data, and that's because these are the outputs of the component, which are going to be handled by some other component. So you send these with rays. Uh, you, you send these out into the ether, and you hope that it's handled by a parent and sent back to you in some way. That was uh, one of the shortest crash courses in halogen you will probably get. I hope that you are all now experts and have no more questions. But if you do have a question, uh, about how this works or how what a component is doing or anything like that, uh, I can answer it really quickly. Sure. How would you, you, you can raise this thing, so could some other component get this thing back? So I didn't show it here for simplicity's sake, um, but this query, so data query, uh, this is any time you want to run a computation. And when you have a child component, you write a query that's called a handler, and it'll be like handle you know, x child component, and that will take as an argument the message type. So raise under the hood does some machinery to connect those two together, and you write your handler for it there. So the parent writes the handler as a query and an eval. Anybody else? OK. Good. That was a lot of halogen stuff. We're now going to use these ideas to actually write a type ahead together. We're going to write it using halogen select, which is a renderless component. Uh, halogen select is not the only renderless component. You can write these yourself in your own code base. This is not strict to this library in any way. Uh, and as I start on this, I'd like to say that this is really going back to reusability. So we've talked about halogen a bit, but we want to be able to take our type ahead that our designer gave to us with all those behaviors, use some shared behaviors that somebody else has already implemented for us, but still be able to capture our original design without having to modify it to theirs or ask them to change theirs. So I'm going to go a little bit quickly through this, because a lot of it is just mostly HTML rendering. Um, but this is what it's like. If you were to bring in Halogen Select right now, and your designer said, I need a, I need a type ahead, uh, autocomplete, this is what you might do. So the first thing you might do is you might write your render function. And if you look at this render function, this is all standard Halogen. There's almost no use from select at all. So there's no functions or anything like that being used. This is all like a, a div element with two child elements. One of them is an input. That's render input here. And it's got a class of input. When we render the container, here we see our first use of select. And it's not imposing anything on you. You're not required to use anything at all. But you have access to anything that is in the state of the component that you're writing this render function for which is nice because you have any access to the state it has plus any state that you want to add in as well. So that's the way that you're able to extend it. So here, it maintains visibility for you. So you can say, if it's off, I don't want to render anything. But you might want to render like a refresh data or something like that. Uh, if it's on, then we're going to, in an unordered list, we're going to list out all the items. And again, that's coming from the, the uh, select state. And finally, the render item itself uh, is going to use a highlighted index, which is also maintained by select for you to decide whether or not to put a CSS class. Other than using this state, uh, this is largely all stuff that you would have written yourself if you were writing this component from scratch without any external library. The main things that are different is one, that state you get to hook into, two, the uh, type signature. And the type signature you'll see is select. So this is the render function that's going to be given to select. This can sometimes be a little confusing if you're writing this within your parent component. I recommend writing out the type signature rather than leaving it open so that you remember that here you're in the context of this component. Um, but generally, this won't give you trouble. The last thing is down the bottom, at the very bottom, there's this thing, action. And action is just representing this click that we want to do. So on click, now it's a little bit different from what we did before. The original component was just on click, run my action. But now, we, we're giving this to select. This is inside of the select component. 
And the select component doesn't have this query. It doesn't have my action. That's mine, and I'm embedding it. So how is it supposed to do anything with it or evaluate it? It must be able to, or else this would be entirely useless. Uh, so somehow it is causing this to become evaluated. And I'm not going to tell you how just yet, but I will tell you in a moment. The f will you show how you inject your own state in addition to the select states? Sure. Um, I could just tell you right now. So let's say uh, this will have to be hypothetical because I don't actually have a code snippet. But let's say you changed, let's say that this was in the where clause of a parent component. So you're writing it in the scope of a parent component. And then you can just use anything from your own state in it. Yeah, and then pass it in. You don't have to do that. If that's like cluttering up your code, you don't have to. You could make this function be my state to select state to select HTML. And then you just apply it to your state before you pass it in. That makes sense. So you, so you, you need to pass this to it, to the component as input. But you could apply it to your state first. And now we have a fully functioning component a uh, fully functioning render function with all the queries attached as far as select is concerned. And that was quick, so I'm going to go back and show you again what I just did in that toggling. But what we had before was this render function. We wrote it almost entirely ourselves. Uh, we used a little bit of state from the interior component. But this doesn't actually trigger anything. Like on click, we need to select the item. On mouse over, we need to highlight it. We need to do all these things and all these behaviors. And to do that, we have to have some way to stick them in our props. And we could just write them all out. But what select does and what any renderless component will do is provide you with a minimal number of helper functions for you to apply in your HTML at strategic points. I'll explain what I mean by that. So this is what we had before. And this is what we have now. And it's, it's done. That's a good question. Um, there's three things that changed, and the imports will tell you what. So in the imports, we've imported these three helper functions, set item props, set input props, and set container props. What select requires you to do is on the items that you're rendering in the list, you have to use set item props on it. What this will do is attach all the queries necessary for clicking and preventing default and highlighting and all that stuff. If you look at the bottom here with render item, it's render item, index item, and then we do a, a list. Um, or an li, and then we use set item props on our already existing set of CSS, other click handlers, like what event handlers, whatever we want it to do can be in there, and select will augment it with what it needs. In render container, you see the same thing. We have our unordered list, and then we have set container props. We didn't have any before, so it's just the, uh, the empty array. And then finally, on render input, we have set input props. So with these three helpers, you are now done with your render function. You could pass it in. You can change it. As long as you use these three at the right points, on the input itself to capture key presses, on items, and then on the containing element, you're good to go. And this is what I mean when I said at the beginning about design freedom. You get to really design things how you would like. Any questions about this before I move to the next, next section? Or the next slide. We're still, in the, we're still putting this type head together. It's not that easy. Uh, so these set props functions, what, what are they? We're, I said you use this helper and you're good to go. All that it is is the set of uh, events and queries that will be triggered by them that you want to work out. Uh, so you use this. It will append to your array that you have, and you're good to go. Now you've got them. There is one caveat here that I do want to call out, that this will overwrite. If you already had like a mouse down, this will overwrite it with R1. If you need to have both of them, then you see here we have this on mouse down do and then prevent a click and then select. Uh, if you needed to trigger your own query as well as the stuff that select does, instead of using this helper, you would look at what the helper is doing and add your own one in here too. So you'd do select.prevent click, select.select, and then you do my query after that. Uh, this, this is also a powerful way of disabling behavior. So if you don't want it to do something that it does by default, you can just remove the query here, and it will no longer be triggered. So it's a, it's a nice way to both add or remove behaviors. In general, you don't have to worry about this too much. If you read through a tutorial and they say, use this on this element, if you use it, you're generally good to go. But if you want to dig in, it's quite simple what's going on under the hood. Next, we're back into standard halogen territory. This has nothing to do with renderless anything. This is just mounting a halogen component. When you mount this component, uh, you need to import it. You need to handle the messages that are output by it. 
And then in your render function, you need to pass it its input. Uh, I won't get too deep into child query and that sort of thing. That's just listing out what possible children you might have. Uh, the main thing here is the select input. So this is the input that it requires from you. So there is still some configuration. You could use this to drive a calendar using a button, or you can use a text input as we have uh, in the type ahead. The items, it needs to have some idea of what available items can be selected to render out in the first place. So you are responsible for passing those in. However, you could also augment it so that it fetches this uh, asynchronously. Uh, debounce time, it handles debouncing on your behalf if you would like. So it'll debounce 500 milliseconds if you're hitting an API. And then finally, and this is the most important one, you give it that render function that we just wrote. So we wrote that render select. Uh, and you're responsible for passing it via input. This is where you, for example, would use your own state. You would sue render select applied to ST, applied to state, and then pass it in. So this is important because every time that this parent component re-renders, it's going to send this input again. And if anything in the input has changed, it will send those changes down. So that's how if, you, if your parent re-renders and has new state, and that state is used in the render function, it's applied and then passed into the component. So this allows you to do things like embed the current date into that date picker and that sort of thing. Finally, we have to, like in any halogen component, handle the output messages. Searched and selected are pretty, pretty standard stuff. What do I do when there was a search performed? What would I do when there was a selection? But the one that is interesting is emit. And emit is a message that contains my own query. So if you remember when we put my action into the component, we want this action to run. Well, how does it ever get run? We have to have some logic that it's coupled to. And this is where that logic would be, is when that query is returned to you through a message called emit, you can recursively call your eval on it. Because your eval function is from my query to some, some evaluation. And you just gave me my query back, so I can recursively evaluate it. Now, it's not shown here because I have no idea what that action will be, but it might be something like hit an API, or remove an item, or do this. Whatever it is, it'll be called back to you. This is one of the trickier bits to, to start getting comfortable with. But the, the main way you can think about it is in your eval function, in your behaviors for your component, write what it is that you want to happen that's new. Then use raise, which is a constructor from select, to embed it in the component. When that is triggered, it will be returned to you in a message, emit, at which point you can recursively call it eval. Right, yeah, so uh, let's, how far back is that? Oh my god, okay. So in this date picker, select has no idea about these dates and the current date and changing it or anything like that. So we actually embed that. It's inside the select component. And when you click on this arrow to go to the next date, it returns that back to us our parent says, OK, let me move to the next date and tell you what the new date is. And that cycle allows you to embed all sorts of new behaviors into a component. Oops. All right. So that was a really brief uh, review of how you might build a component with this. But I hope it illustrates how with you controlling the HTML and you adding your own behaviors that you want, you can use a shared base of behaviors that's available to you. This, I do not expect you to be able to take two of these slides and put it into production. Instead, we've written a pretty lengthy and thorough uh, tutorial to building a type head, more like the one that I showed you that's a lot prettier. Uh, this tutorial at the select documentation site uh, will run you through that if you're a little bit more familiar with Halogen. If you're brand new and you also want to learn Halogen along the way, there is also a very thorough beginner tutorial to making a drop down with this. Uh, both of them will teach you a lot more about renderless components. In the next step, I wanted to uh, show you guys a little bit under the hood. When you write one of these, when you write select, for example, what do you have to do? What makes this work? Before I get into that, uh, I want to return to the theme that this is about reusability. It's about putting a shared base of behaviors and state and so on that can be extended without somebody ever having to come back to you and say, hey, can you add this option for me? Or hey, I need this to be different somehow. Or I have to write my own now, that kind of thing. Now, I know that I went through a lot with that type ahead example, um, what I'm going to be talking about from here is not what it's like to use one of these. So I will no longer be talking about things like uh, handle select and, and these sorts of things. Do you guys have any questions from this section that you would like answered? <laughs> 
Very good. In that case, we can get into some of the more, more advanced, some of the more fun stuff. Uh, this is what it's like to implement one of these components yourself. And what I have here, this link, which is uh, Thomas Honeyman slash PureScript Halogen Renderless. It's not a library or anything like that. It's just a scaffold with all of the queries that you might need to start using one of these components. So I would recommend checking this out, copy pasting the code, and going from there. The nice thing about writing one of these components is that there's very little that it asks of you beyond writing a component as you would any other component. So you write your date picker without a render function. You just leave that out. And then you're responsible for two or three things that you'll have to pay attention to that the scaffold takes care of for you. So if you have any interest in starting to implement these, uh, this is a good way to get started. The first thing is that Comonad that I promised you, which is store. And I'll get to the reason for this after I walk through the queries. I think that'll motivate it a little bit. So the first thing involved in a renderless component, and, and just to stop for a moment, the point of this is that we want the render function to be entirely controlled by somebody who's not the component. And they can use that as this critical point of entry to modify the behaviors, modify the state, and modify the rendering. The problem is that as we saw in closer to the beginning, this query type, this data query here is not the same as the one who's going to be writing this and embedding things. But in Halogen, for you to write this state to HTML, it all has to be the same query type. And this is pretty standard algebraic types. If you want them to unify, you have to wrap one in another. They have to be part of a greater sum type. So in this case, raise takes this O. And this O parameter represents some other component's query that they want to put into this component, or they want raised back to them. So every time you see that O, that's your parent query that you're going to be embedding, or some other, some other person's query. Receive is what's handling input continuously. So when you get a stream of these inputs, what do you do with it? And I'll show you what we do with it in a moment. Our input at least has to have a render function. It has to at least be able to render state to HTML. If you don't pass this render function as input, if you decide to pass it as an argument, then when the parent state changes, you won't get the new input. You'll only ever get it that one time you pass it as an argument. So it's absolutely critical that this is passed as the input. Every renderless component will require this. Finally, we have the message. And the message couples with the raise. So if you remember back when we did a, a brief intro to Halogen, the input and the receiver are together. So when you have an input, the receiver says, what do I do with this input? The raise here is going to be coupled with emit. So raise is how you embed. You say, when this is clicked, I want to raise this query to myself. And this message is the actual output where you are doing that action. You are raising it back. And then if you remember, the parent will receive that, select.emit, so it'll receive its query back and evaluate it. So these are the main types involved in the pattern. But in the middle of this, we don't just have state, we have state store. The reason that we have to use state store instead of just state is because our state type can't just hold on to a render function inside of it, because the render function is itself from state to HTML. So it's referring to itself, which would be circular. Now, you could put your state into a new type and in that way manage the circular reference. That's one way. It puts a new burden onto the end user. They now have to deal with a new type instead of just a record. But that is one way to get around it. However, your render function is state to HTML. And you have no way, when you create a halogen component, to get that render function to the component. At the moment that you create, I'll actually go back to show this. At the moment that you create this component, my button, it takes that initial state function, a render function, an eval function, and a receiver function. But if we pass this as an input, the render function has to exist when the component is run. You can't pass it in later. As in, you can't retrieve it from the state and then use it on the component that itself is holding the state. All of this gets very confusing quickly. And store provides a way around this. Store is a co-monad that essentially acts as a box that's holding some data. And when you pull that data out using a function called extract, when you pull that data out, it transforms it on the way out. It's kind of like having a tissue box with, and the opening of the tissue box as you pull it out is laced with ink. So it's all white tissues inside the box. And as soon as you grab it and pull it out, 
it gets colored on the way out, at least in the context of using store to HTML. We have our, in the box, we have our state, and when we pull it out, we're getting HTML. The use of extract, that function extract, when it pulls the data out of the Comonad, will transform it to HTML. So really, this is our render function. Like, you could just rename store to be render, it's state to HTML. The way that this works is we use extract to just be our render function. So when this component is going to run, out of its environment, which is the store comonad, it's going to pull that data. And when it pulls that data, it will, get, it will be running HTML. Now, that's a little bit of a, uh, a bastardized explanation of the, of the store comonad. That's how we are using it in this context. It is not a formal definition. Uh, so if you would like a formal definition, I would have to refer you to the, the documentation. Um, but this is what it allows us to do in this context. So in this way, we have no intermediate HTML that's wrapping anything. Our render function is purely the render function passed via input. So there's no, like, it's not like this is all being mounted inside a div or something like that. It's just absolutely the render function you pass in is the one that gets used. That was a lot. Does anybody have a question uh, that might help clarify that or a correction to fact check me? Either one is welcome. OK. The next thing that any renderless component is going to need to do is actually evaluate its queries. So anytime that you write these queries, like raise and receive, you have to have an accompanying evaluation for it. So these are just naming computations that you want to happen. The eval is the actual bit where you do that. So in the case of raise, very simply, we'll unwrap raise, and we will send that message off with your query. This is how the parent will know that they've received something they need to do. When we receive the render function, things are a little bit trickier. We need to update the entire store, not just our state. So we will reach into that store. We'll give it a brand new render function with all the new state values and all the new queries that the parent had. And we can also update the internal state, our state record, at the same time. Doing this makes sure that things like the, the date picker changing dates those, those values in the render function are able to continuously update. And then extract is able to pull them out again. So here you are replacing your entire store. Well, before I move on to the next slide, this is, this is all that has to be in a renderless component. So you've got your two queries, your one input, and you're, you're pretty much good to go. Uh, if you just did this, it would be entirely useless. It's, basically does nothing at all. You could use this just to write a normal component and just embed everything into this, but that would not be uh, worth doing. Instead, if you start to expand the functionality, what you would generally do is add a new query, add a new query, add a new query. And as you add each new query representing some behavior you want, like clicking on things, and I want this to fetch the data and parse it, those sorts of things. So if, if my added query here was to go fetch some data and parse it, you would add it as a query to name that's what you want to do. And then you would add it to your eval function. Here's actually do that, fetch the data, get it back, decode it. However, we have a little bit of a snag because we're no longer in a, in a state monad over our state record. It's over the entire store. So every time we want to work with that state, we need to go into the comonad. We need to work on the state value itself. The way that you can do that when you're modifying the state is with seeks which is also from the comonad uh, module. And you just intersperse that. So rather than modify state with this function, you do modify state with seeks of this function. What that allows you to do is rather than you modify the entire store, modify the state within the store. That's what the seeks is doing. Uh, we also have this helper function get state, which you'll generally find pretty useful. This unpacks the store and then throws away the render function because we don't care about it in the eval and just gives you back your internal state that you wanted. So that's what's happening here with this get state. You're not using get from, from the state monad. You're using this helper function get state, which is unpacking from the store after getting the state. Now that is a whole bunch of words about state and stores and comonads and all sorts of nonsense. When you're actually using this in practice, Generally, if you just replace your uses of modify or put with modify seeks and put seeks, and if you replace your get with get state, otherwise you're writing this as you would a usual component. That's really the only overhead that you introduce as a developer. <laughs>
Okay, this, uh, this talk today was a pretty rapid crash course in what renderless components are, why they exist, why we want reusability, and a little bit of what is halogen and how does halogen work, and finally, how do you write these components. I don't expect you to be able to remember all this stuff. So we've put together a few resources that are involved in helping you take these ideas, make them more concrete, and start to use them. Uh, first, we have the Halogen Select Library, which you can use to build uh, user interfaces like the two that we did. So a calendar, or a type ahead, or that kind of thing. We also have beginner and advanced tutorials for using it. And those also go through things like what are renderless components and how do you use them. The scaffold that you can use to bring into your project right now and start using this practically is PureScript Halogen Renderless. And then finally, those two components that you saw, the date picker and the type ahead fetching Star Wars characters, uh, you can use those. Those exist in an open source library called PureScript Ocelot. This is our design system at CitizenNet. Uh, some of these components are renderless, some of them are not. Yes, Dave? Oh, in a week, you can have our date picker. You can't have it until then. It's like waiting for Christmas. Uh, so yes, you can use those as well. Even if you don't want to use those components, they're a good example of what we use in our actual 30,000 line of code halogen uh, app. We use these components. They're our actual design system. When I'm talking about putting these renderless components into practice, that's a good place to actually see them in practice. So as I, as I wrap up, um, I wanted to reiterate what the beginning of this talk was about, which is about reusability, not just across your UI, but reusability between components. Now, often as you're writing things in Halogen, you don't have to worry about this too much. You have your component, it's this lovely bundle you can use everywhere, and you just use it. But occasionally you will find a time where you and a colleague need to share a lot of behavior between two components. When you do that, your best bet is to either reach for a higher order component or for a renderless component. In most cases, I would suggest that you should reach for a renderless component and implement it using that scaffold or just from scratch uh, in your code base. And in times where you really need access to every one of those queries of the wrapped component, I would suggest reaching for a higher order component. Uh, and that's it for me. Thank you.